things I find is that it's really easy to detach yourself when you don't have to feel anything about something. It's called entitlement. It's called privilege. So this evening, I welcome you to the office, and we are here to talk about two of five sculptures that I am creating for an initiative called the Enslaved Africans Rain Garden. I would like to, first of all, I'd like to unveil them. So let's start with that. Um, one of the things, one of the things um, that I did at the beginning of this project, for those of you that have been following me, um, is I, I wanted each sculpture to be iconic, easily recognizable. So I began with what I thought was an iconic image of an African woman. And the Phillips family, when they first began slave trading uh, in 1685, I think it was, um, they went to Angola to Guinea. And so I was looking for Guinea names. And it's amazing, you know, when you Google stuff, you think that if it's, if it's there, you should be able to find it on Google, and it's not true. And so I couldn't find any names from Guinea. So Liberia is right next door. So I picked the name Isati. So I'm going to unveil Isati.
one of the most important things, again, was to humanize them. So I wanted to give them, well, a soul, for starters. Um, so that's easy for me, because most of my sculptures have souls. Um, but ironically, uh, social media is an amazing thing. Um, one of the things that I discovered when I was making the maquettes, the small ones, is that people all over the world watch you on social media and there's this wonderful exchange and it didn't matter if people didn't speak English. People wanted to talk about the meaning of the artwork and how it made them feel. So one morning I get a phone call from a man that named himself Ty Gray L. And Ty and I talked the first time for a couple of hours, and I said, we're supposed to do something together. And so Ty has been part of my artist talk for the last eight years we've been working on this. And this year I challenged him to tell me, who are these people, these people? So I'm going to invite Ty up to talk about who is the Sati? Ty. A celebrate standing on the shoulders of those who allowed us to be here in the first place is uh, commendable to me. So I, I'm, just, I, I'm just happy to be a part of this project and I'm humbled by it and I hope I do it service. So this is, a, Vinny asked me to write a story about Isati and this is what I came up with. Let me just tell you first, briefly. I had written a hundred stories prior to this one about enslaved Africans in the South between 1830 and 1900. I've written a hundred of those stories. She challenged me to go back a century, which was out of my comfort zone. So, but the person, the personage that I use to effect all of those I'm using here again. So this is the story. My name is Lightning Gray. So named because I struck by lightning twice and electrocuted five times during the construction of the telegraph and the railway. I believe because of all them electrocutions, I am able to read from the book of God's remembrance where not a word is lost. I am able to tell the stories of formerly enslaved Africans who lived long ago. Some will, undoubtedly, find this hard to believe. But they come to me with their stories, and I tell them, this is Asati's story, word for word, just as it was told to me. My name is Isati, which means to mend, to sow, and heal. Although I was captured by the slavers at the place they now call Guinea, the true name of my home is Benin, in the village of Idu, I am of the Fulbe Fulani and the people of Benin Songhe. I am the descendant of weavers and seamsters. I was a seamstress to the royal families of all Songhe. There is no fabric that could not be spun. There is no silk that could not be woven. And it's widely recognized by all that I was born with the gift of stitching and mending. By my 14th reign, I was well on my way to becoming the number one seamstress in my village. Indeed, it was believed by, that God himself had guided my hand. Before my capture, I was being prepared to oversee the creation of most all the garments worn at every coronation or festive occasion. Before my enslavement, it was known that I was destined to make beautiful even those who were not, for I was the daughter of Mutabe, the chief needleworker. My days were spent learning, reading the text of the ancients and studying the rich and glorious history of my people. School was filled with stories of conquest and intrigue. I loved the oral traditions of our griot, Maliwu. He could change the atmosphere with his voice. The young of the village would sit for hours and listen to story after story, tale after tale. It was our task to remember the glorious history of all our ancestors and keep 
their memories alive. The day of my capture will never be forgotten. It was seven days in front of my 18th reign. As it was custom, I was gathering flora for my coronation. It was to be a grand affair. If you were to compare, you could liken the celebration to that of your midsummer or your accession day. Most all of my village would be bedecked in the finest raiment, all prepared by my family. By the year 16 and 70, my village had been trading with the Dutch, Portuguese, Spanish, and French for more than 200 years. I heard many stories of the kidnappings, but because of my status, I believe no such ill fortune could ever befall me. I, along with two close cousins, ventured west into a garden filled with marigold, as it was the color of my raiment, and the flowers would line my apprentice mantle. One moment, I was bending and gathering. The next, I was surrounded by 20 or more tall men from a tribe I did not recognize. They rushed upon me, and for reasons I do not to this day understand, I never screamed. They threw a sack made of burlap over me. I was knocked to the ground and lay there for a long, long time. When I was jostled awake, there were other men who placed chains and manacles on 15 of us, some of whom were from my village. We marched for three sunrises, and each day there were more and more of us. When we finally reached the shore, there were perhaps 20 or more white men whom I believe had been released from hell itself. The rabble had long hair, blue white eyes, and smelled like wet goats. They laid the lash upon the backs of those who moved too slowly with whips made of bull hide. They screamed and spit like madmen while shouting words that none of us could understand. We were thrown into canoes and shipped out to the man-eater. Man-eater is the name that was given to the big boats who swallowed my people and ate them while alive. Before the journey was over, I wished a hundred times that the legend was true, as death would have been more pleasant an outcome than the fate that had befallen me. I have no way of conveying how much time was spent in the belly of the man-eater. I don't have words in English to explain the miserable state of the wretched souls that were thrown atop each other like mackerel from a fisherman's net. If not for the fierceness of my pride, all human dignity would have been stripped from me as it was ripped from so many poor souls. There are no words that properly explain the anguish on the face of one who has given up all hope. Just before they leap to certain death in the raging sea, the light of life leaves one eyes while they are yet alive. There are no words that can convey the torment in the voices of those weeping and wailing. There is no translation for the pain and suffering delivered through the stroke of a cat or nine tail. There are no words for the stench of urine, feces, and fear that mingled together and rose from the whole of the good ship Beaver. After sailing perhaps two fortnights or more, being below deck all hours except when we were washed and danced, there was no way of knowing exactly how long we were at sea. After weeks and weeks, on the day we were transferred from the Beaver to the Pearl, I recall seeing one of my countrymen slip on the plank between ships. His neck struck the edge of a plank and snapped like a corn stalk. He tumbled to his death, drifted off with the tide, and no one attempted to retrieve him. I remember thinking that he might be better off than the surviving lot of us. Once aboard the Pearl, I was thrown in the hole beside several sacks of cayenne red pepper. There were two whom I was thrown beside whose bodies had reacted to the pepper in a manner which caused them to swell. Their eyes bulged and hives broke out all over their skin. They groaned as their bodies bloated and swelled to almost bursting. 
The whites of their eyes yellowed and pus ran from them. I too became gravely ill. The black pilot of the ship, who was not the captain, but was clearly not a slave, I would later learn, was the cause of me being removed from beside the pepper. I must say that, had he not provided intervention, I would have died, as did the other two, from my fits of sneezing and coughing. We arrived at New Amsterdam in the high heat of summer. I believe because of my sickness aboard the Pearl at Barbados and the boatman's intervention, I was separated from my brood. There was such a bustling ruckus and business banding about that confusion seemed to be the order of the day. There were as many blacks milling about as whites. There were also Mohawk, Manhattan, and Delaware natives everywhere you looked. I was taken to a tavern where I was washed by some black women who spoke only Flemish, Portuguese, and a dialect of Mende that I could not understand. They fed me, washed me, cleaned my hair, and put a dress on me that was so heavy, it was like walking with bushels upon my shoulders. After two sunrises, I was placed in a horse carriage with two children, a boy around 10 years of age and a girl around eight along with another wench. Wench was the name given to all enslaved women. It was a day's ride from the dock at Hudson's Bay to the sprawling green estate at Phillips Manor. The strangeness of the dwelling confounded me, for I had never seen anything similar. We approached during the night, and the lanterns in the two large windows from the distance made it appear to be a huge monster with yellow eyes. The smoke rising from two chimneys on either side looked like ears adding to the horror. I was reminded of the fire-breathing dragon tales that Maliwu told. It was as terrifying as the ship itself. We were taken to a small wooden hut, one of perhaps 10 lined along the south side of the estate. There we were given food, water, and blankets. On the very next sunrise, we were all, more than 30 or so, including little Shola and Olamide, forced to stand in a line as the Mrs. Margaret Phillips, along with an overseer named Master Henry, and two house slaves inspected us. What I remember most about that day is that the Mrs. appeared to have no lips, just a cruel line where her mouth should be, and the meanest set of eyes I had ever seen on a human. After inspecting us all, she came back to me in the line where her mouth should have been softened a little. She beckoned me and instructed both Shola and Omidi, Olamidi to accompany her to the manor. There it was made clear that I was to see after the children and was to work in the main house. Besides care for the children, I worked from what came to be called Cape Sea to Cape Sea, sun up to sundown. I emptied the slop buckets. I scrubbed and washed the linen, the walls, the doors, the soot from the fireplace and the soot from the kiln. I washed the windows, the dishes, the pots and the pans. I swatted the carpets, swept and mopped the floors, scraped the wax from the candle holders and mended the curtains, dusted the furniture and fed the dogs. I slapped the hogs and fed the chickens. I milked the cows, groomed the horses, and cleaned the troughs. I polished the silver and the guns. I washed the pardon. I washed the clothes, darned the socks, and sewed the sweaters and the coats. I also went to market to fetch groceries of the day. I expect I worked 18 to 20 hours a day. I worked till my back and my knees and my hands pained me to tears. There are two occasions where I saw the boatman called Timba, who had rescued me from the death of Red Pepper when we were moored back in Barbados. Once, while I was braiding Shola's hair, he entered the rear of the mansion, never seeing me. And once, when Olamide and I were at the wharf collecting perch and codfish, he never saw me. 
I was a slave on the estate for 12 moons before he spotted me. He spotted me carrying a bushel of pears on the dock at Schleier's Hook. When our eyes locked, my heart forgot to beat for a time, and I almost dropped the bushel I was carrying on my head. From that day forward, every day he was landside, I would see him. One late evening before Sabbath, as there was no work the next day, he heard me singing a song from my homeland. I was again braiding Shola's hair while singing in my native Fula. He came close to the porch and smiled while I sang. He then did something which caused my heart to almost leap like a white-tailed deer. He spoke to me in Fufulde. I had not heard the language of my people spoken so beautifully in over a year's time. His words brought hope and promise. He asked me to continue to sing, and I smiled. I smiled for the first time since my capture. I smiled because it was not my singing that made for melody, but Timber's voice which brought music to my ears. So, so don't you feel like she might be the person now? You feel like you kind of know her? So my girlfriend, Tony Clymer, this evening brought me an authentic shackle that came from Nigeria. So imagine this is what you have around your wrists, your feet. And so again, the goal of the enslaved Africans rain garden is to make people believe that enslaved Africans were individuals. They were real people with faces and voices and dreams and lives that were stolen from them. And so now I'd like to introduce you to Timber the Boatman. Danita, it's nice to see you here at the event. Can you tell us what brought you here? Well, I know Vinnie since she was little. Her mom used to babysit me when I was little. So this is like family. And to be able to say that I know someone that did something this creative, it's magnificent. I still have goosebumps. And looking at the gentleman that she sculpted, I had tears in my eyes. I could feel like it was part of my family. And I understand the slaves that were brought here in shackles and how they were treated. You got such a feeling that it was family. And it's just unbelievable. It's magnificent. She does marvelous work. And I can't wait until the other three come out. So, Danita, keep us in mind. When things come out, let us know because we want to be there. I, I certainly will, just like I did this one. You're an important part of Yonkers. You're exposed to social media and this is how we keep in touch but congratulations to Vinnie she did a wonderful job and I'm so proud to know her. Vinnie nice to see you. Nice to see I, you. I saw your artwork actually it connected to me because I am from Mozambique South Africa close to Angola I heard everything that happened today but from your point of view tell me how was the vision? You know it's a, an amazing story uh, you know when I first was conceiving the story, I'm trying to figure out why does this matter? Why would anybody care about enslaved Africans in Yonkers? And it's interesting because as the story began to unfold, it got more and more interesting. So the first thing, of course, is that the Phillips family was the largest slave trader in the country, second to the folks in South Carolina. You think of New York as being a place of sanctuary. New York was financing slavery. It was an economic development endeavor. And so the second thing was that I found out was that John Jay wrote the first law to free them. 
and it was 64 years before the Emancipation Proclamation. So, of course, New York was one of the first places to, to free enslaved Africans, but this is years before the emancipation. So, in my opinion, that's what makes it a national st important story. And then, of course, the interesting thing is social media. You get to talk to people all over the world. So I have a lot of friends from Africa, and I get to hear their thoughts about how they feel about the people that they lost from the continent. We always think about the people that were here, but we never think of the people that were lost, millions and millions of people that were stolen from the continent, and how that impacts Africa now. And so it's, it's a, an amazing story, and um, I just want people to learn about this place and the importance and the significance of the role that New York played in the liberation of enslaved Africans. Vinnie, let me tell you that I am African, and a lot of people from Africa, I was born and raised, we don't know much about it. I know. And so this is not just fun because it's art, but it's also edu education. You know, education. Yes. So what do you want to tell the people who has, will be watching? We have over two million viewers in our Yonkers Voice. Do you have any message for them? Public art represents the community's sense of value. When you go into any community, you can discern the values of that community by the public art, which is why now these days there's such a ruckus about the Confederate public art because that's no longer real, that's propaganda for that era. And so this is why you have a lot of places around the country dismantling their, their sculptures that no longer represent, number one, the community, and that also aren't really telling the truth about, well, the Civil War, among other things. And so the, the importance of this project is that it brings the history to life, it humanizes the people, and it educates people about where they live. The people who move to Yonkers now are mostly going to come from other places. And so we want them to know what this place not only is, but how it came to be. Now, I know that uh, the family, as, we, as you call them, we have two statues, the family. When are the kids going to be completed and ready? Okay, so there are two children that are going to be created. Uh, the National Endowment for the Arts has funded that to begin. So I'll be starting that next month. Uh, you guys can follow me on Facebook and Twitter. And uh, that's another thing, is, is enabling people to see public art in the making. You know, a lot of people don't get to see that. They see the sculpture after it's installed. But I think that, you know, as you begin to talk to people about the process, people appreciate and value the artwork more because they, they understand what goes into creating a project like this. This is one of the largest monuments to enslaved Africans in the country. There aren't many monuments at all. After you do the icons like Frederick Douglass, Sojourner Truth, Harriet Tubman, this public art project represents the everyday person, the nameless, faceless people. I'm trying to give them a face, a voice, a soul. And so I think that's important because that's what's going to make people care about them. They're individuals, they're people like you and me, except for they lived yesterday and at some point will be history. And so the idea is to make people care, to make them value, because I think a lot of the reason why there hasn't been a monument is because people are detached. They think of enslaved Africans as other. It's not about me. And it is all about you, because these were the original inhabitants of this country. These are the people who laid the foundation, not only for New York, but for the entire country. They built this country when nobody else wanted to come here. Well before the Europeans came, the enslaved Africans were here. And so people need to know that, because that's part of the truth of the history of this country. So Vini, social media is a powerful tool nowadays. Tell the, our audience, how can they follow follow you, your website, your social media site, Facebook, tell them how to find you. Okay, so I'm Vinnie Bagwell, like my cousin Vinnie, V-I-N-N-I-E, uh, Bagwell. You can find me on Facebook. I have two Facebook pages. One is Phil, but no one is, is not, so just, you know, connect and we'll be friends. And then, of course, there's Twitter, and, of course, there's the Rain Garden website, which is enslaved 
Africans with an S, rain, like from the sky, garden, all one thing, dot org. If they Google enslaved Africans, enslaved Africans, rain garden, rain garden, Vinnie Bagel, it's going to come up. And, you know, we, we try to keep people current with what's happening now because we want people to stay involved with this as it comes along. It's a long process. This is year eight. We have two more, possibly three years to go before it's finished. And we want people to come along with it so they can appreciate the value of it when it's finished. Thank you very much for your time, Vinny. And hopefully we will see you on the next event. Yes, thank you very much. Appreciate your time. Thank you. Good night.